our last speaker today, and you'll have to forgive me, but I'm going to pronounce it the way I think it should be, <laughs> Professor Robert Tranquillo. Is that correct? Tranquillo? <laughs> it's Italian, okay. <laughs> Tranquillo, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I did study Italian a little five years ago, but uh, anyway. Uh, he works at the Departments of Biomedical Engineering and Chemical Engineering and Materials Science at the University of Minnesota. He received his PhD in Chemical Engineering in 1986 from the University of Pennsylvania. He was a NATO postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Mathematical Biology at Oxford for a year before beginning, of his, beginning his appointment at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science at U of M in 1987. He served as the head of Department of Biomedical Engineering from its inception, from 2000 until 2019. He has used <laughs> combined modeling and experimental approach to understand cell behavior, in, in particular directed cell migration and cell matrix mechanical interactions. More recently, his research program has focused on the role of these cell behaviors in cardiovascular and neural tissue, tissue engineering applications with a focus on clinical translation. His research program has resulted in over 120 peer-reviewed original research publications as first or senior author, being recognized with his selection for the Termis AM Senior Scientist Award in 2015 resulting intellectual property for a cardiovascular regenerative material platform technology was licensed by Vascudine, Inc. in 2017. His research has been continuously funded, funded by NHLBI R01 grants since 1998, and major funding also currently includes a Department of Defense, is that DOD, I'm assuming, okay, CDMRP TDDA grant and Regenerative Medicine Minnesota grant. He currently also co-directs the NHLBI T32 Cardiovascular Engineering Training Program. Professor Tranquilo is a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering, International Academy of Medical and Biological Engineering, and the Biomedical Engineering Society, and he is also a distinguished McKnight University professor. So let us welcome Bob Tranquilo. Good afternoon. I, I wish I had sent the short version, so uh, thank you for going through all of that. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I realize I'm between you and dinner, so I'll try and keep this uh, relatively short, and plus for time for questions. Okay. Let me see if I can figure out how to advance the slides. It must be this. So I'm required to uh, give you these disclosures. Uh, Vascudine was mentioned. Uh, I actually have interest in Vascudine. And I'll mention them briefly uh, as we go forward here. Okay. So a few years ago, one of my medical school colleagues uh, told me, you know, engineers are just plumbers. And I was at first put off by that. Uh, but on the other hand, it, I mean, it's kind of true, right? Here you got a plumber and you got a pipe and here's a valve and so, right? That's very important for a lot of things that chemical engineers do, and I am a chemical engineer. Okay, um, so, but I embraced it finally, because you know, when you think about it, you know, heart valves involve vessels, which are like tubes, and of course, a heart valve is a valve, and so I thought, all right, so I am a plumber. And so you've, you've seen a lot of this already today, and I got here late, but uh, Dr. Beckman gave a nice, uh, overview of uh, aortic valves, and here you're seeing at, at, at the top a, um, uh oh can I go backwards? Mm, there we go. All right, so at the top here, yeah, in the aortic valve, so this tricuspid or trileaflet valve, and at the bottom if the movie plays again, yeah, you'll see a aortic valve that's been uh, mounted in the laboratory, my colleague Paul Izio at the university, and you can see the flow through the valve, and those leaflets open and close, and that allows the blood to be ejected from the heart and not leak backward. So that's a normal aortic valve. It's an amazing design. I mean, it does that like three billion times in a 
lifetime of a healthy person to age 80. So it's like better than any valve that's ever been made by a human. So it's quite impressive. Uh, but it doesn't always go exactly uh, that well for everybody, of, of course, as, as you know, that's why we're here. And so uh, there's about 100,000 valve replacements in the US population per year. Most of those are either aortic valves or uh, mitral valves. But there's a small number of valves uh, that need to be replaced in basically infants. And uh, you know, for them, it's, it's a much different story. So I want to say a little bit more about that. Before I do, you know, there's great solutions for adults, basically, right? So you've already heard about the mechanical valve and the tissue or bioprosthetic valves. I mean, they're not perfect, but they're, they're really good, thankfully. Uh, but the, the drawbacks are, are, have already been mentioned um, by Dr. Beckman, so anticoagulation for mechanical valves. The tissue valves don't last forever. Uh, but, you know, the problem is really quite severe for children who have typically malformed pulmonary valves, which you may not have heard about. Sometime also the aortic valve is malformed. But whatever valve it is that they need to be replaced is a really big problem because none of the valves that are used for adults or that exist, period, grow. And of course, kids grow. Infants grow to be adults. And so uh, they are faced with multiple open heart surgeries uh, and, you know, it's really quite uh, dire for them and their families. So, uh, you know, we basically set out to try and address that. So I will get back to aortic valves at the end, adult aortic valves, but I'm going to take you through what I do personally in my research for uh, pediatric valves that grow. And someday we hope to be able to uh, get this uh, current situation of three or five open heart surgeries until they're adults and have their final valve, like mechanical valve, put in at age 20. Um, to just one open heart surgery as an infant because the valve we make can grow. That's our goal. All right. So, you know, if you're in heart valve tissue engineering, as it's called, it's a little bit like being in a candy store if you, like, decide that's what you want to do uh, because uh, this is a picture from a candy store in uh, Shakopee, I've learned, the biggest one in, in Minnesota. Uh, you know, there's, like, any number of polymers you can choose from. So you have to have a material. So polymers are great materials. My colleagues in the department make all sorts of cool polymers. And there's like no end to the number of like types of polymers you could choose from. And then beyond that, there's like, well, do you use a woven polymer or electrospun polymer? Or, so it's like the processing part. Again, you can choose all sorts of cool things. And then, of course, there's the valve design itself. So once you have the material, like how do you make it into a valve that functions like a valve? So, you know, if you just kind of jump in, it's like right off the bat, it's like there's like an overwhelming number of decisions you have to make. So we actually didn't go that direction. I kind of went in the, the back end uh, of this problem, as you'll see here. So um, we, some time ago, had been, uh, when I first started in Minnesota, actually, interested in the problem of wound healing. That's what I did at Oxford. I was trying to understand how cells exert forces on materials, and that can lead to wound contraction if it's a blood clot. So long story short, like 30 years later, what we do is we try and harness wound healing to make a material that can work for uh, vascular and valvular replacements. So basically what we do is we take a donor skin cell. So each of us has lots of skin cells in our skin. I can donate my skin cells to Vasconine, for example. Uh, I didn't do that. Uh, and what we do is we entrap them in a solution that becomes something like a blood clot, except there's no red blood cells, so it doesn't look like a blood clot, but it's essentially a biopolymer called fibrin. Fibrin's a blood protein, so it's like an organic alternative to these synthetic polymers in the candy store. So we were studying this uh, cell matrix mechanical interaction in fibrin gels, and it turns out if you uh, are a little bit clever, and we are, are a little bit clever, um, you can induce the cells to convert that very soft jello-like material that has no particular structure into something that is the form of a tube where the fibers become aligned because the cells pull on them and rearrange them and eventually convert the fibrin that we start with into a cell-produced collagenous matrix. In fact, we can remove the cells with detergents and now we have basically a cell-produced material in the form of a tube uh, that you can put in the refrigerator and put into any person because if you take the cells out, it's, an, it's not going to induce an immune response. So uh, that's pretty cool if it works. And in fact, it does work. We can make uh, tubes of various diameters. So again, a, a, uh, one inch is like 
25 millimeters, so you know, six millimeters is about a quarter of an inch. Uh, that's that one. This is like half an inch here. Uh, this is what you would use more or less for coronary bypass. If you have atherosclerosis and you need to get around a blockage in your coronary artery, it's also uh, useful for arterious venous grass for dialysis patients, and that's what Vasconian has done in their first clinical trial. So this has actually been put in people now successfully. So that's all cool, and we've studied it for many years. Um, the most recent cool thing, and it's this DOD grant we got, is to um, look at the possibility of correcting uh, malformed vessels in infants so their valves are good, but some kids are missing a branch of their pulmonary artery. So what we've done in a, a sheep study, it's actually a growing lamb study, so these are very young lambs. Our surgeon has taken out a piece of the left branch of the pulmonary artery, so here's the main pulmonary artery, here's the left branch, here's the right branch, and they took out a uh, piece when it was about six millimeters in diameter and put in one of our tubes and hope that it would work. And so, in fact, six months later, you can see it's about twice the diameter. It's now like 12 millimeters, and it's not too much different from the downstream normal pulmonary artery. So there's a nice demonstration of this material that can grow. So what happens is the material that we implant is very conducive to recellularization from the host. So the host cells repopulate it. And then the cells are really clever. They figure out what to do. They can grow the tube to be the right size. So that's really exciting for us, and hopefully we can start a clinical trial uh, within about a year. But as we were doing all this work, this is maybe mm, 15 years ago, we had already kind of gotten into heart valve tissue engineering because that seemed like a good thing to do on, on top of vascular tissue engineering, higher bar for success, but certainly a big need, we think, uh, over the current available valves in general. So. My research associate walks in and he says, Bob, you got to see this patent. These people figured out how to make a heart valve out of a tube. And I thought, oh, that's great. Tubes are us. We are now going to get into heart valve tissue engineering. So uh, it's, it's a very simple concept. It's the idea of a collapsing tube. So if you have a tube and you can strain it at three points and apply a back pressure, the tube collapses inward between the points where it's constrained, and voila, you have a one-way valve. And that's what a heart valve is, basically. Okay. So we got into the business of making heart valves from tubes, and we make all sorts of different valves. Uh, the one I'll focus on is for kids, so this one has no inert materials in it, like a stent, or in this case, there's a plastic frame uh, for that valve. So these would be suitable for adults, but not for kids, so that's the one we've uh, focused on. And we had to come up with a new design, so right in the candy store, there's the material, there's the design. So it turned out with our material, we had to conceive a new design to make a tri-leaflet valve. And so we have three tubes. We cut out a notch from each tube. We suture them together with a degradable suture in a closed ring. And when you look from above, I think a surgeon would say, oh, that kind of looks like a tri-leaflet heart valve. Would you agree? Yeah. OK. So, but you know, does it work is the big question. Well, it actually works fantastic. So when we implant it into young lambs, it works just great. And in fact, that's not a high bar because nobody would spend whatever it is, $10,000 on day one to implant it into an animal, which is what it cost me at the university. So I better do better than that. Um, but before I show you what happens after a year, we're right before dinner, so warning. Uh, the next slide's not any worse than any that you've seen recently, but it is getting close to dinner. Okay, so um, these are results after one year of implantation of our valve in this growing lamb model. So here are three valves that were taken out from the three big sheep because they grow really fast in a year, go from a little lamb to a big old sheep. Okay, and you hopefully agree that it looks kind of like a valve with thin, pliable leaflets, and these valves were working quite good after one year of this growth. So uh, the, here's the gory part. So in the same lamb model at the university, they implanted a valve that's actually put into people, and after 20 weeks, you can see, you know, they don't look so good. And so those valves are made from uh, animal tissue, and they put these valves into sheep to test them for calcification because sheep are very aggressive for, for calcification. So this sort of thing doesn't happen in humans, but it can tell you that the material is prone to calcify. So our material doesn't, so that's fantastic. So, uh, but the other cool thing is that, um, so initially the valve diameter was 19 millimeters, and after a year it was 25 millimeters, so 
almost a 50% increase in diameter, and that is the right diameter for an, an adult sheep. So the cells that repopulated the valve made it become bigger in diameter, about the right diameter, and in fact, when we take these three valves and slit them and lay them flat, here are the three leaflets, we make measurements actually with echocardiography, and we can see that the free edge length of the leaflets also got larger, like about 25%. So the leaflets seem to be growing as well as the root of the valve. So that's a really promising thing that we're quite excited by. Okay, uh, final slide, basically. So, all right, that's great for kids, but what about adults who need an aortic valve replacement? Does heart valve tissue engineering offer anything for them? And there's a, lot, there's a couple of uh, groups that are way ahead of us. We put these into adult sheep in the aortic position with some success, but here's the real deal for clinical trials. In fact, there's just one clinical trial so far. So uh, this is, I believe, out of Hanover Medical Center, by the way, where Dr. Beckman's from. So they take cadaver valves. So from a deceased person, they'll take out the aortic valve. They will use detergents like we use to take the cells out. And then that's what they would implant into a patient. In fact, they have a large clinical trial that has been going on for some time. And the results so far are as good as the standard procedure, like you heard from Arnold Schwarzenegger, the, the Ross uh, procedure. So, so far, so good. Um, you know, it's not clear what the durability long term is. You know, it's only been a few years, not 30 years. And so whether enough recellularization occurs in these valves to give it durability, which is what gives durability, is the ability of cells to create new matrix to replace damaged material, we'll have to wait and see. But so far, so good. Now, some people would say, well, that's not really heart valve tissue engineering. It's just basically you're taking a real valve and doing some chemical treatment and using it. It's not like going through the candy store and choosing a polymer, et cetera. Well, this company, Zeltis, has been in the candy store, and they chose a particular polymer I won't go into, and a way of doing the processing of the polymer to create this trileaflet valve. And they're not in a clinical trial yet for adults, although they have put this into infants uh, for, or children for repair. Um, but they've done a sheep study in adult sheep, and they, basically the results look quite promising. Uh, so we'll see uh, what happens in the future. All right, so whether our material turns out to be the ideal heart valve material, I think we've checked a lot of the requirements. You know, we haven't done 20, 30-year studies yet, so we don't know whether our material, after it's recellularized, has the durability that we would hope for, but we certainly would expect it. That's what living cells do. So time will, will tell where we go with that. So I um, want to acknowledge all these folks, uh, former students, particularly the ones in the maroon and people at the university currently who help on all these projects as well as our funding sources. Uh, and so now we've basically come full circle, right? Uh, except for one important update, uh, you know, I am a, a plumber, but I can actually plumb the cardiovascular system. So uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, sorry, note to self. Send slide 14 to medical school colleague. Okay, so uh, I'll follow up on that. Uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs>